This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, that's Jeff Kissel. He is the former CEO of Hawaii Gas, and he's a trustee and a distinguished fellow at Energy Policy Research Foundation, Inc., otherwise known as EPRINC, in Washington and around the mainland, and for that matter, the world, uh, here for Energy in America. Welcome to the show yet again, Jeff Kissel. Aloha, Jay. It's great to be with you, even though I'm across the ocean today. Okay, well, but you'll be back soon. We'll spend some time. Anyway, I will uh, look forward to Let's let's talk about let's talk about events here in Hawaii because I know you follow energy as you have before, um, in all capacities here, and, and we have some interesting things going on. For example, we have not only a PUC docket but a statute requiring a um, a, re, a, a, a study research study and uh, the determination of new performance standards, uh, which uh, are in which will be involved in rate making here. Um, by Hawaii, Hawaiian Electric. Uh, I'm sure you've studied that, and I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on what happened and um, where it leads. Well, it's groundbreaking legislation. There are two other states that have uh, similar kinds of legislation that they're implementing. It's Minnesota and New York. Um, the difference is those two states are fortunate enough to be able to participate in the national grid. Whereas Hawaii, of course, is, is sitting in the middle of the ocean, relying on aging equipment to stabilize its power sources. And I think it's, it's an enormously positive step forward because it will encourage all of the sectors in Hawaii that have anything to do with energy production to do it cleanly, efficiently, and hopefully at a, at a reasonable cost. You know, Jay, there, there's something that people need to think about. There are only a certain number of kilowatt hours consumed in Hawaii, you know, a few hundred trillion kilowatt hours a year. And the cost of producing that electricity and getting it to the customers has got to be borne by the people that consume those hours. So this legislation attempts to spread that cost on a new model which is not based on the cost of the installed plant, but on in terms of the efficiency and usefulness of the production of that electricity and distribution of it. That's really new thinking. And the PUC will need a lot of support, a lot of input, as it develops the regulations that will implement this kind of legislation. Mm. Let's unpack that a little bit. So in order to determine the performance standards model, What's our existing model? Can you give us a precy of how that works right now, how it has worked traditionally, historically, and in other places? Yeah, the, the model that's been in place for over 100 years has been the, the utilities get a monopoly, whether it's gas or electric or in the old days telephone, of course. They get a monopoly, and then in order to figure out how much they can charge for their service, the commission says you are entitled to earn a percentage return on the investment that you make in the system. And that worked really well for a very long time. So that, you know, you, you invested a couple of million dollars, you got a 10 or a 15% return on that. And that was included in the price that everybody paid for power. Well, that model is obsolete. It's as obsolete as Toys R Us uh, department store. <laughs> Toys R Us. So it, it, does, it, it doesn't work anymore. Why, why and, doesn't it work? The, What's wrong with it, Jeff? Well, it, it, because it doesn't encourage the, the upgrade of the utility plant to meet modern standards. And many states are starting to consider a change in that model. Um, Hawaii, Minnesota, and New York are the three that have adopted a model similar to the one that you described in your introduction, where the utility gets graded on its ability to deliver useful power to its customers. And that's a major step forward. Now, getting from where we are, which is the, the legislative stage, to the implementation stage, 
is going to take a lot of work and a lot of collaboration. And Hawaii needs to do that and in the process hopefully revive its ailing renewable energy industry, mm -hmm. which was a pioneer in America and is now in, in desperate straits because of the change in the net metering law and things like that. Oh, I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. So the, the word you mentioned that caught my attention is the word process. So the, uh, the PUC opened a docket on its own motion uh, to determine these standards. And at the same time, interestingly enough, and I don't know whether it was coordinated or not, um, the legislature ordered the PUC two weeks after the PUC opened the docket that the PUC should open the docket, sort of a retrospective order. And uh, well, so now it will proceed. But I'd like to know the process. Well, I mean, the process, of course, after uh, Donald Trump's Twitter tomorrow, taking credit for the whole thing, uh, the process will begin where the PUC orders hearings, starts to study the matter, and, and moves uh, to get community input as well as industry input on how to develop the regulations that will change from the return on investment model to the quality of service model. And that is a, a huge undertaking. It is, it is as big an undertaking as they have ever um, thought to do. Why, why is that? Other people have said that too. That is a huge undertaking, that it's fraught with the possibility of delay, contention, controversy. Um, why is it huge? What, if, if you could unpack that a little bit for us, what has to happen? What has to be decided? What are the stumbling blocks? Well, right now, electricity is billed on a rate per kilowatt hour, and that rate is around 50 cents or so. Now, the question that, that the PUC will have to wrestle with is how can they equitably bill the customer and still reward the, the customer for conserving energy, reward the utility for delivering it more efficiently, and move toward Hawaii's goal of 100% renewables um, over time. That's, that's a big, big deal. Because at the moment, there are, there are four major perils that are, are facing the, the customers as well as the utility and their shareholders. One is fuel. Fuel costs are rising and going to continue to rise over the next five to ten years before renewables can come into play. Second is the cost of renewables. In Hawaii, the cost of renewables is high and rising. Third is the ability of the utility to continue to deliver reliable service as it makes this transition. You know, as I said earlier in the, in the broadcast, the people in New York and Minnesota can rely on a grid where they can, they can get power from the neighboring states. Hawaii gets power from 75-year-old steam-driven power plants running on fuel oil that have to keep spinning as, as the reserves for the renewables are required so that when the sun goes away, when the wind stops blowing, the people of Hawaii still have electricity. That's a huge undertaking. The fourth is the political winds. What is going to happen in terms of who is going to get the, the regular, who is going to help the PUC implement these regulations and what interests are out there that are likely to impede the implementation of these regulations? Well, one of the uh, expectations is that whenever you open a docket like this, um, you get a lot of interventions. And in this case, since it's, uh, you know, the center of the docket is rate making and, and the, um, the new the new element is uh, performance standards. Um, it's going to draw everyone in as an intervener. Uh, gee, I remember in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, the uh, portfolio standards um, process that happened a couple of years ago. It took a long time, and it was, it was, uh, it was not successful. Uh, it came up with no, no real decision. Um, and there were like 70 uh, stakeholders. 
And I would worry uh, that that will happen again because this rate making and performance standards are, the, are interesting to everyone, to every organization you can think of. And so they'll all be in there intervening. And every time you have an intervener, you have, you have another, per, another voice. And that voice can listen to the other voices and all the voices talk together, respond to each other. So it takes longer, uh, you know, by some factor, every time you add a single intervener in these, in these processes. And I, I don't know if the PUC has a way to stop that from getting out of control and taking forever. Um, and let me offer also the thought that to the extent that it takes a long time, it's holding up, you know, the, the, the organic process of moving toward 100% renewables. Uh, you know, the process that exists right now today without any changes in rate making. So I, I wonder what your thoughts are about how we, that is the PUC mostly, um, handles intervention, intervention by everybody who has any interest or any re remarks to make, any opinion to provide uh, on performance and on rate making. Well, I think it's going to take some leadership from the other branches of the state government. Uh, most notably the governor's office, because if, if they don't, what's left of the Hawaii renewable energy industry, the independent providers, people who put solar on people's roofs, people who build wind and other renewable devices, uh, that's going to continue to die away because of the lack of net metering. So, uh, you know, I can't wave a magic wand and tell them to re-implement net metering so that you can keep the the solar industry alive until these re regulations are promulgated. But somebody's got to take the a leadership role and speed this, this new regime to the marketplace so that Hawaii's renewable energy industry won't die away completely before there's time to implement. Well, if you wanted to save uh, the installation industry, the solar installer industry, and I certainly agree it needs saving. It's, it's been a sick puppy for at least a couple of years, maybe three. Um, how would you, you know, what would you address in this, uh, in the regulations now to be mm, organized, issued, negotiated, discussed uh, in the, in the uh, coming um, docket, in the docket for uh, performance standards, the new docket, uh, what would you do in order to save the industry? I mean, could you lay out some sort of broad terms on that? What should they be thinking about what kind of initiatives would be helpful to save the industry? Well, the, the, the actual bill actually contains language rewarding the utility for speeding the implementation of, of renewable energy uh, at the customer level. The PUC already has the power to re-implement net metering. They could do that um, in an orderly way uh, as an interim step to getting these new regulations in place. Mm -hmm. And the minute you put back net metering, I, I hate to use a, a, a pun, but it's like throwing a light switch for the, the solar industry. <laughs> it, it puts them back in business. <laughs> you know, it's a, there was a bill, uh, Senate Bill 2100, and uh, it was the third time this bill uh, was introduced um, in, in, I think in two prior legislators, legislatures, it was introduced under other names. Um, and it was intended to um, change uh, the tax credits for uh, solar installation and also storage, that is battery installation. And it was uh, going to ramp down the tax credits for solar installation, but ramp up uh, the credits for um, storage, uh, uh, storage uh, installation. The idea was to uh, try not to spend that much money, um, you know, out of the public funds for these credits, but to change the direction, change the incentive process, and incentivize installers into putting in what what we all believe is necessary. That is storage on both existing solar facilities and on new solar facilities uh, that is related to an existing facility or not. So uh, the storage facilities, you know, the storage installation could be built. And I think a lot of people feel that 
um, that the low-hanging fruit in, in installing solar by itself is not nearly as attractive to the industry, as helpful to the industry, as opening the new you know, potential floodgates of incentivizing storage. But that bill failed in year one, failed in year two, and a couple of days ago it failed in the conference committee for reasons people have no idea about because the, the matching bills from the House and the Senate were similar, very close to being identical, and the, the, there didn't seem to be any issue that at, at conference it would be, it would be um, you know, approved in some very close form and submitted to the floor for a vote and with a lot of support for it. But now it's dead, and this is the end of the, the biennium, you know, so it's going to have to be resurrected, if at all, next year. Now, that bill, I think, would have been good news for the solar industry. It would have been good news in, in terms of doing these, um, uh, you know, joint projects with solar and storage, or storage all by itself. And it would have resurrected a lot of economic activity within the solar industry. Yet. So where do you see the connection? I mean, is there a connection? Uh, is there a rational reason for doing that? Uh, was that a mistake? Um, how does that play together with this new performance standards docket at the PUC? Well, let, let me comment in two ways. Uh, I respect the legislative process, and I can't, I can't judge it. I, I may or may not agree with the outcome. But the process has been running, and we've got what we've got. So, so I will, I'll address that. But the second thing I'd like to say is that from a practical matter, storage is very, very expensive at the individual level. And sometimes it's not even practical because the, the home configuration is, is difficult to, to adapt to small-scale storage. So from a technical standpoint, it, it's, it's not the greatest solution that there is. The grid is the best place to have storage because the grid, especially in Hawaii, can be made to have the flexibility to take on the surplus power, even though it's expensive. And I, I'm not suggesting that, that it's not expensive and it can respond more quickly than installing an awful lot of batteries, which actually are pretty dangerous for the environment you know, on, with present technology. But getting back to the, the major issue, the legislature has spoken. We got what we got. So let's find a way to unify around what we've got and make the best of it and get it implemented as quickly as possible. And, and really that's the, the most important thing because You've got at least two more years before you're going to get a storage bill through, if at all. Uh, you know, you've got the election coming up, and nothing's going to happen. And you've got the, you know, the first year after the election, and people aren't going to spend political capital except on sure winners. So my, my recommendation is let's rally around the PUC, let's support them and encourage them, and hopefully the, the, the state will lead the way in implementing the, the legislation that has been put on the books and the docket that is up there right now. And that means following through on the possibility of a kind of resurrected net energy metering uh, in order to allow consumers to sell power back to the utility, I suppose, and as well as developing a, a more robust grid. Uh, is that what you're saying? That's right. And, and recognize there's a cost to all of it, and we need to be prepared to pay it. Um, and, and nobody's going to get rich unjustly off of it. We'll all be better off because we'll all be sharing power. And there, there are a couple of alternatives to net meter. There's wheeling of power. The, the ability to, from, for me as a, as a homeowner to sell some of my electricity to my neighbor or to somebody across town. And, and so far, Hawaii has steadfastly refused to consider that. It may be time for the commission to consider that and allow it. But that's a decision that's a regulatory decision. It's not a legislative decision. Yeah, and that reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you. Is it, so we, we'll, have, we'll have hearings, we'll have interventions, we'll have lots of issues will be raised. Uh, lots of people will, will be focusing on 
getting to cheaper rates. The installers will be focusing on protecting their industry or even building it and so forth. Um, I, I think I see this as not only a place in which regulations will be issued, um, but a place that will germinate new legislation as well. You know, a springboard for new legislation of all kinds. It's, so it's not, I, I see it as not only the PUC, um, but the legislature getting involved uh, in this initiative. Uh, they're both already involved, um, and I, I suspect they'll both be involved in trying to work these things out. Uh, how do you feel about that? The legislature has taken a huge step forward. It's a bold piece of legislation. It shows that they're serious about changing the, the service delivery model in the utility sector. And that is a terrific thing. The next thing they've got to do um, is walk away from what I believe is, is a seriously flawed policy of relying entirely on oil and coal for power production in the interim till we can get to renewables. And I, you know, that's really sucking the lifeblood out of Hawaii in terms of the capital cost of keeping this aging plant operational and, and not modernizing it. Well, I'd like to connect that up with a, with a, a documentary I saw just last night, Jeff, um, on PBS, and it was about the, the state of affairs in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has had lots of fiscal problems over the years, and uh, that's a whole other story. It involves uh, uh, bonds that later turned out to be junk bonds uh, from Wall Street. Uh, it involves um, mismanagement. and involves a failure to maintain existing power plants and um, generation equipment and grid equipment. Um, but when that storm came, Maria, last year, uh, that was the pennies on the eyes because uh, Puerto Rico had the $70 billion worth of unrepayable debt. Now it had a storm that, that stopped its economy in, the track, in its tracks, and it had a power grid that's going to cost a fortune uh, to put back online. And, and I uh, watched this thing in horror, in horror that uh, Puerto Rico was so ill-prepared for what happened, uh, and that FEMA was so ill-prepared and un unmotivated uh, to try to help, and the federal government has really let the, the whole thing uh, come crashing down in Puerto Rico, where still there's a lot of areas that have no power. People are connecting the power lines themselves. Individual citizens are out there with their trucks and cranes doing the job themselves because there's nobody else to do it. The, the place is coming apart. People are leaving. Puerto Rico is in terrible, terrible trouble as a, a community. And I wonder your thoughts about what we can learn from what happened in Puerto Rico. Because we also have unrepaid and maybe unrepayable uh, liabilities in this state. Um, and we also have, um, you know, a grid that's complex but also independent because we're on an island. And we are, can't be sure that there's somebody will save us in the event of a disaster. And we have climate change with the notion of extreme storms. It sounds like a... a a following track uh, that this could happen or something like this could happen to us. And I wonder your thoughts about, you know, the, the current action, what's being done and what we can do and what the risks are for us uh, as against the scenario in Puerto Rico. Well, it, it did happen to us. Hurricane Iniki devastated Kauai. The question, and, and it was rebuilt um, because the president at the time thought it would be very good because he was running for re-election. So the resources poured into Kauai in, in a, a huge way. Um, there's no guarantee that that would happen again. And there's certainly no guarantee that it would happen on Oahu. Um, you know, the current administration, I don't think, unless you know, some, you know something I do. Um, sorry, you know something I don't. The current administration is not particularly fond of the Democratic administration in Hawaii and doesn't view Hawaii's electoral votes as necessary for it to become reelected. So although Puerto Rico is a recent example and a very tragic example, uh, we lived through it. I don't know how we would survive it again if it actually hit Oahu. 
And remember that the industry that uh, exists today is tourist-based. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to spend the amount of money that we will need to spend to recover from a major disaster if we have to rebuild the grid entirely in order just to get power running. Uh, it's better to spend the money now gradually and improve it and strengthen it than to, to, to rebuild it all at once. We all know that. But we lived through it. Yeah, I mean, gee, the, as you described that, I, I have the vision of uh, the tourist industry stopping short, you know, zero tourism because, um, you know, no power. Uh, and then we're stuck without any, in, that huge source of revenue that we, we have had and relied on uh, and continue to rely on every day. Um, we have no revenue from our principal source of revenue, and yet we have this huge and unplanned for, unfunded obligation to put the grid back in shape, which would cost a lot of money. In, in Puerto Rico, it was essentially destroyed. Um, that could happen here. And so if both of those factors work in tandem and, and take the place down, we could have a similar scenario. And I totally agree with you. Now is the time to make the grid as resilient as we possibly can. That's the, that's the backbone of our society, you know? It certainly is. And the, as again, the legislature deserves a huge amount of credit for taking this initiative and passing this legislation. Now it, it's going to take community resources, leadership from the state government, um, and certainly from the PUC to get the program implemented so it's working the way it was intended in a reasonable amount of time. What about uh, individuals uh, who might want to, you know, put uh, solar or increase solar on their homes and put storage or increase storage on their homes? What, what's your advice to them? Should we have this happen at the individual, uh, you know, homeowner level? Or should we have it happen at, at the grid level, at the utility level? Mind you, a lot of people say that, that an extreme storm, uh, in an extreme storm, you would want to have, you would want to be self-contained, self-reliant, independent from the grid, because that way, uh, you, you know, you'll have your own system, you'll be able to generate power yourself. I mean, what's, what's the solution for the individual homeowner or individual homeowner who, who would like to invest one way or the other? Well, the trend is, is for more and more multifamily housing. So we, well, the individual homeowner is a really important part of this process. Um, the, we need to, to see what we can do to encourage multifamily um, developments to have community-based uh, renewable energy sources, uh, whether, it's, whether it's solar or wind or some of the other technologies that are out there, uh, we really need to encourage diversified energy production and distribution. You know, that's been the theme that, that I have sounded ever since I ran the gas company. We need a diversified source, uh, we need to diversify our sources of energy, not concentrate them and rely on one and one or one or two sources alone. Yeah. Well, I think from this discussion, it's, uh, it's clear that this new docket of the PUC uh, comes at the right time. And these questions are really important to going forward, not only uh, in terms of implementing the 100% uh, goal, but in terms of protecting us from all, all kinds of risks that we will probably have to deal with. So uh, it's very, you know, ambitious, it's very challenging, and, and as you say, it's promising in the sense that we'll have to address these things and maybe come up with some solutions that we would not have otherwise considered. Um, so, gee, this is an, we're having, uh, we're having the, uh, the new uh, 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 PUC director on the show next Monday, you know, Jeff. Uh, that's Jennifer Potter. Uh, she was recently Hi. appointed and confirmed. So uh, we'll, we'll have her for a discussion of the same issues. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I think that's one of the most useful things that you can do is, is to keep this issue in front of the public and, and keep the progress uh, known to everybody so that if there are things that you know, 
people can do. You know, perhaps we, we need a little more compromise in in some of the positions people have taken, and and get this thing to market, and then you know modify it, refine it, move it forward um, over time. Because the other big unknown is what technology will be out there in the near future that may impact our ability to, to move forward either more quickly or in a more efficient manner to get, get kilowatts done, produced uh, less, uh, less expensively. Absolutely. Um, Jeff Kissel, a trustee and uh, a distinguished fellow in the Energy Policy Research Foundation, Inc., uh, in Washington, D.C., joining us for a discussion of energy in America and, of course, energy in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Jeff. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Likewise. Thanks again, Jeff. Aloha.